Hello, my name is Radzi and welcome to the Moments That Made Me in association with the University of Hull. Welcome back if you've listened to us before and hello if this is your first time. And if it is, in this series we discover the three moments that have defined the lives of some of Britain's finest Olympic athletes. This is episode seven and already we've heard from Pete Reid, Ed Clancy, Becky Adlington, Becky Nelly Downey, Maddie Hinch, Natalia Mohammed, and Denise Lewis. Now just a quick heads up, this was recorded by the way during a lockdown, so just to bear that in mind. But for this eighth episode, we are joined by one of, I suppose one of the most overlooked pure elite sportsman in this country. He is the four times Commonwealth Games gold medalist, the four times European champion, the three times world champion, and the two times Olympic champion in the sport of gymnastics. I give you Max Whitlock. I am properly excited about this one. It is not every day you get to speak to not only a, a GB gymnast Olympian, but an Olympic medalist and an Olympic gold medalist at that. Max Whitlock, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Not too bad. Now, for me, life doesn't change that much being in lockdown. I like to go to the gym, but for you, everything has changed. How has lockdown been for you? Um, crazy. Uh, it has. I think uh, it's brought its challenges, definitely. Um, I, think, I do think everyone's going to have their different struggles, but... Yeah, I mean, I've definitely come across struggles along the way, but I've just tried to kind of stay positive as much as we can. And I think the most important for me was, thing for me was utilising this time so that, you know, we do have the Olympics coming around in a year's time. And if, whether or not we was in lockdown or not, I couldn't actually afford to waste this time now. Well, it's safe to say you're focused. I'm curious to know how well you know your own career because you've obviously had goals which you've achieved. I'm sure you've got more goals, but I've got five questions to test Max Whitlock on his career. Are you ready, Max? I'm probably not ready because my memory is probably the worst out of anybody, (laughs) so we'll see. (laughs) Okay, Max. So how many medals across Olympics, World Championships and European Championships have you won? The total number of medals. How long have I got to answer this? God, um, is it, is it, is it, tw- is it 20? 21. <laughs> <laughs> Five Olympic, eight world, eight European. Mate, that, that's what success looks like when you can't quite remember. That's brilliant. Um, so question number two. One of your first major medals was silver in Delhi, the Commonwealth Games that you mentioned. Uh, when competing for England, but can you name the other four members of that team? Um, yeah, so it was m- myself, Luke Folwell, Reese Beckford, Danny Lawrence, Steve Jehu. Well done, mate. Well, there's normally one that you can't quite remember, but smashed it. Question number three. You were part of the bronze medal winning team at London 2012. Can we ever forget that? But what was your team's final score? You're going to make me really look bad here because I have no clue. Um, a wild guess, literally. One, six, five? Two, seven, one. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad maths for you, that is. Mate, you got, you got on the podium. You got on the podium, it's all that matters. Um, question number four, at Rio 2016, you not only became the first British athlete to win an Olympic gymnastics title, but you were the first British gymnast to win two, but not, it was also in the same afternoon, but how many minutes between the start of the floor final and the start of the pommel final? I think it was around 90 minutes. Mate, that's pretty cool. It was 101 minutes, to be precise. It was a, such a remarkable couple of hours. I remember watching that, thinking, this is like watching a sports day, but in real life, an Olympic standard sports day. Uh, but we, we'll come on to that for sure. Uh, final question. So early this year, you released the book, The Whitlock Workout. But what rating does it have on a very popular online retailer? It's out of five, and they give it to 0.5. Is it 4.5? Yes, it is. Yes, Yes, it is. (laughs) That shows that I'm checking that too much, probably. (laughs) So, mate, this podcast is all about the moments that made you. And I imagine there are so many moments, but you've kindly distilled them down to just three. And your first one, I think, speaks just volumes 
about your ambition from a very young age and your decision to leave the country. I, I had a big decision on my hands when I was 12 years old and that was whether to follow my coach. My coach left me. I trained in a local centre in Hemel Hempstead and my coach left. He was Slovenian. He went back to Slovenia, back to his hometown and um, he gave me the option to follow him, um, go and live and train out in Slovenia and it took me a long time to kind of make that decision on what to do because it was a big one for me, especially being that young. Uh, it was a big decision for my parents as well. Um, and I started to not enjoy gymnastics as much. It started to go downhill a little bit. And I got to a point where it was, do I follow my coach, continue gymnastics, or do I quit? And that was probably one of the only points in my career where I've actually thought about stopping gymnastics. Um, so it was a huge decision. And I obviously decided to go, um, which I look back now, my parents look back now and just think it was crazy. Um, I went out to Slovenia, got a flight on my own when I was 12 years old, um, not knowing when I'd come back. It was just a single way flight and just seeing how it would go. But it was my only option for keeping up gymnastics. I didn't want to go to any other club at that point. So that was my, that was my route. And I lasted three months, you know, until I missed it missed home so much, I missed my family so much, and I wanted to come back. But it taught me a lot, um, and I don't regret going at all, because I would have always thinking, be thinking, what if? And you never know where that would have taken me if I didn't go. I could have not been doing gymnastics, I wouldn't have been where I am today at all. Um, I decided to go home, and I picked a club to go to, and it's the same club, South Essex, that I'm at now. Um, and I think that, yeah, I suppose it does show the drive from when I was young. You know, I I wanted to continue gymnastics and I went to all lengths to do it and even going to live abroad with my coach. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy, but that's if you want to do something, you've got to, you know, make some sacrifices to do it, really. And when your coach left you, do you recall how that felt? Because I imagine your coach is very much like a father figure. And for him to leave, that, that's not just a coach, it's so much more than that. Uh, you're 100% right, yeah. A coach isn't just a coach, especially in gymnastics, but in most sports. Um, you know, that was a time in my career where I was probably training about 30 to 35 hours a week, spending that many time, some, spending that much time with my coach, um, who took me from the age of seven and made me that gymnast to who I was when I was 12. Um, and I learned so much in that time. I loved the sport. So he had a huge impact on my life, massively. So him leaving was, yeah, devastating. Um, especially when, you know, that's when my gymnastics started to go downhill. You know, when he left and that's when I started to not enjoy it as much. Um, so that's why it was kind of a game-changing moment of me going to live abroad and, and, and training back with my coach getting my love back from the sport. Um, I was at that time as well, I was actually recovering from an injury. Um, so, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of things going on, um, but that was kind of a big kind of reset, if you like, working out what I want, what decisions I want to make and how I want to move forward. So it was hugely, hugely beneficial for me going out there and that's why I don't regret it. Uh, before we did the record, I reminded you of when we possibly last spoke and I said to you really casually, I think it was 2015 October, the London Marathon. And I just said to you, you know, what are your plans for the next sort of 12 months, 24 months? And you just said, become Olympic champion. And you just said it so casually, but so definitely. And when I've seen you be interviewed before, you're you're very humble. Dare I say you're more quiet than you are loud. And definitely next to somebody like Lewis Smith, you were the quieter guy, but there's clearly a steely determination. Was, was that always there even back then? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think if you, if you want to achieve something big on what you're doing, you have to have that drive. And I had that drive without knowing what I wanted to achieve. And I think that was what was so powerful. I just wanted to be the best I could be. I wanted to improve every day I went in the gym. I wanted to, you know, constantly, constantly learn. And I'm still learning now. And I think that's why I love the sport. You know, gymnastics, I never, ever stopped learning. And when I was that young, you know, I was literally learning new skills every week. 
uh, and it was just constant. And that's the, that's the good thing about gymnastics. And I think that's why I thrived off it. And that's why I you know, got so much drive from a young age because I was doing something I love. I was doing something where I was learning from. I felt like I was improving. I could get a lot from it. And then when I started competing, I started seeing results. I started seeing that actually what I was putting in, I was getting out. So it was like the more you put in, the more you are going to get out. And that is, that's just the way everything works. That works in sport, outside of sport. And that's where I talk about motivation is absolute key. I've been lucky enough to be quite a motivated person ever since a young age. And I think that's what's massively helped me achieve results. Um, and then more importantly, achieve results after results. Because that's one really tough thing that people don't touch on a lot is having a result can be a make or break moment. So it's important to be able to try and keep that up and keep the momentum, which is such a tough thing. When you're about to compete, is that something that you relish? Do you feel nervous beforehand? Do you, what actually goes through your head? Nerves like crazy, um, even now. I think if I didn't have nerves, I think it would show that I didn't care as much. You know, I think nerves show that you care, nerves show that you want to do well, and nerves also show the work that you've put in um, to make yourself want to make it worth it. Um, and I think I just try and think, um, I've done all the work I possibly can because I'm the type of person that I, I will always go to jail, I'll always train as hard as I can so that when I get to a competition moment and I'm standing there and I'm ready to perform my routine, I know that actually to get to this point, I've done all I can. Um, and if there was a slight doubt in your head that, you know, there was that month or that week or whatever, where I didn't make the most of it or I didn't train as hard as what I could do or I... Or whatever, and, I've, and I'm not saying that actually you need to be training 24-7 because, you know, I still don't feel guilty about taking holidays because that's part of the process. I think it's in recovery is just as important as training, especially as I'm getting older. But I think it's about knowing what you've done um, to get to that point of performing to your best ability is, is all you could have done. You've given everything and just chill, go with the flow, enjoy the experience and give it your best shot. There's nothing else you can do. When you kind of sound incredibly composed, almost like, I suppose somebody who's 27 in many sports would just be getting into their prime, whereas in gymnastics, d different discussion to be had. But a man who's stayed at the top for such a long time is your hero and your second moment that made you. Yes, Kohei Uchimura, um, a guy that I've looked up to for so many years, so many years. I've watched him on YouTube. I've watched the whole Japanese team. Um, just the way they do things is very different in our sport. Um, the style is different. The way they hold themselves is different. They're so respectful as well. Um, and the way they train, um, the way they build up, the way they prepare is very, very different to a lot of countries. So I tried to watch what they did um, and take the bits that I thought, yeah, that could suit me. That could work for me. And actually I can gain a lot from that. So yeah, this moment in terms of... Um, you know, not many people get to meet their idol, um, and I did. I was training just as a, a training camp, Team GB training camp in, in France at the time. And the national coach came up to me and said, do I want to go to the Japan Cup in 2010, this was. So, you know, 10 years ago, a long time. And uh, I, of course, said yes, um, 100%. And um, it was my first time going to Japan. I was standing in the, in the reception area of the, of the hotel, and he was standing there. And it was the strangest feeling in the world because it was the first time I've ever been starstruck um, and it was kind of hard to explain really really was but I've just looked up to this guy for so long and now I'm seeing him in real life and then I had the opportunity to train in the same gym compete against him um, which I learned so much and that the reason why I had such a big impact was my mindset completely took a turn um, and I've always been motivated. I've always been highly motivated, which I spoke about, but taking that to new levels was game changing. So I remember coming back and as you probably know, gymnastics hurts. Gymnastics, you get aches, you get pains, you get blisters, especially when you're a young age and all of a sudden flick of a switch and that was no more. You know, I could go, 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 do repetitions after repetitions because my mindset was I want to get better, I want to improve on this skill that I wasn't good at before. And that was from seeing my idol. 
and it had that much of a huge impact on me and changed my mindset to actually doing gymnastics because I love it, because I just enjoy going in to actually all of those things, but then taking gymnastics into my own hands and where I want to go with it. And I think that switch there was a huge, huge change in the kind of direction in my career massively. When you said they warm up differently, the Japanese this is, and you said I think they're set up differently, what, what, what do you mean by that? Gymnastics, the old school way, would a lot have been, you know, especially it's still on the female side of gymnastics, they do numbers, numbers, numbers. Whereas a simple way to put it, Japan style of training, style of competing is having a better ratio. Um, so less numbers and actually more successful goals. So for me as a gymnast now, we've, and, and as Scott as a coach, we've learned how to utilise that. And actually, it's not about getting all those repetitions in. It's really not. It's about getting the right amount of repetitions for a high success rate. Because what that does is increases your confidence as you go into competition. Because instead of doing 100 reps and falling off 50, um, you do 10 reps and fall off one. So your confidence is high, your ratio is very high. So your chance of thinking that actually, yeah, I can do this and I can make this routine and I can be successful in what I want to do is a lot higher. And that's all you need. Going into, going into competition, you need to have done the work, you need to have done the build-up, but you need to be able to believe what you can do and believe that you, know, you can make this routine because you do it day in, day out. Um, so that's the switch that we kind of learned through the time. And I think the Japanese kind of culture in their sport actually taught us a lot in, in terms of that. So with that in mind, so go if we go fast forward to Rio 2016, pommel horse, you you have the hardest um, difficulty of anyone who's about to compete. At what point do you make that decision about what you're going to do and what tells you that I'm going to push the margins but and it could go sideways as a result? Um, there's been numerous times where me and Scott have been walking out now um, we're literally two, three minutes away from me jumping on that pommel horse and competing and we're then making the decision um, <laughs> which if you the most standout time for that it, it did happen in Rio as well but the, the most prominent time for that where it made the biggest amount of difference was in 2015 World Championships the year before Rio um, we was walking through the tunnel. I was literally two, three minutes out from competing. I don't watch anybody. I don't watch any scores that are coming in. Um, I can only focus on what I'm doing. Um, and that's trying to do the best routine that I possibly can. And Scott was talking to me coming through. Uh, he has to obviously be really careful about what words he's using, how he's saying it. So he doesn't affect my confidence going in. Um, but we still had to make a decision on what routine we was going to go for, what high, what difficulty level we was going to go for. And we decided to go the most difficult. Um, and by that, I knew that big scores had been posted um, without it being told to me. Um, but I knew that I needed to do something good. And um, it was very careful about how we spoke. And actually up in my start score by that one tenth, it sounds very small, but it's difficult actually made me win the gold by one tenth, um, which was just, yeah, madness. But it's those kind of relationships that you build with your coach to actually help that be possible and the preparation and the consistency on what you're training and what you're doing in, in the, in the build-up to help you make be able to actually make those changes. So in 2012, you're, I'm guessing, 19 years old at that point, and you're in a home Olympic Games, and gymnastics was one of the big tickets to have I guess there wasn't pressure necessarily on you to to do particularly well or to get a certain uh, medal but what was that experience like being part of the team especially in London it was unbelievable and I remember walking out into that arena with the boys and just like literally the the feeling the goosebumps on your on your body like I've literally had that twice before and that was actually um London 2012, where you walk out and get goosebumps, and Glasgow uh, Commonwealth Games 2014. And I think because they're, home, they're both kind of home games, and um, just that, oh God, the, the, the audience, the, the, the atmosphere, like, thinking about it now just makes me feel crazy because that experience was just once in a lifetime. It really, really was, because I look back at London 2012 and think that if 
I competed like that in a home games where I, I, I completely agree. I didn't have the pressure of that. You know, I'm expected to produce results, but there was obviously different types of pressure there. Um, if, I, if we can compete like that there, we can compete anywhere. And that's kind of a way that a, te- a technique that I've used to kind of make myself chill going into future competitions because there's nowhere that's going to uh, outdo the support or the, the kind of, the more people rooting for you and wanting you to do well specifically. Nowhere's going to beat that. There's no doubt about that. So now if I can go into any arena, I know that I can do it. And I think it's having that mindset is good. And that's from London 2012. It's been so powerful in my career having that opportunity to go to that home games um, and helped me kind of kind of produce results after that. It really, really did. What actually happened between that time to, to make you go from an Olympic medalist to an Olympic champion? So my mindset was, okay, I've done more than I could have dreamed of. Now, how can I really push it to the next level? I've got nothing to lose. Everything from now is a huge bonus. I'm going to set some targets. Me and Scott sat down. We set a four-year plan on how I can get myself into a position in Rio to have a chance, to have the potential to gain a title. And that was a pummel title. We didn't even think about a floor title because that was just... That that, that was just... Yeah, I won't even go into that because that was just crazy. Um, But it was a chance to try and have the potential potential to put myself in a position to get a title. It wasn't anything other than that. It was just that was my goal and trying to prove myself as an all-round gymnast as well. Um, you know, I, I didn't have the opportunity to do all-round, all six pieces in London 2012. Um, so I wanted to make sure that in this four-year cycle now, I could do it. Um, I had my target set and I just worked and worked and worked until, you know, I got to where I wanted to be. And... I think timing was just spot on as well. You know, I, I was going, you know, aiming to be my best in, in, in Rio um, at that time. And that was roughly peak age for a gymnast. Don't get me wrong, I had hurdles along the way. I got glandular fever in 2015, uh, which completely knocked me back. Uh, you know, so the path hasn't just been just straight sailing. It really, really hasn't. And I had some... Huge competitions where I made loads and loads of mistakes, um, but it's important to know that kind of if you if you have your short term targets, your long term targets, stay driven that you you can get there. Do you know mid routine, mid performance that this is going really well? Do you know, and it's a special one. Uh, <laughs> you you do, but it you you try not to think about it because. Gymnastics, like it's, you're talking about the tiny, tiny margins, and you can do the perfect first half of your routine, but that doesn't mean the second half's going to go the same way. So, you know, it's important to kind of keep that focus all the way through and try and, you know, think just I'm going with emotions, I'm still going, and to never let it get like, oh, this is this is a good one. It's just trying to just carry on. Let's let's do this routine. Let's finish it in the way I started it. On the pommel horse, there's an unbelievable tension where you almost feel like two seconds away from this could this could end this could just fall off or he clips the actual horse itself and you can almost feel the crowd when it happens go oh can you actually feel that tension and that jeopardy almost as you're going through yeah you can you can especially because in some competitions as well um sometimes they don't even play music so it's it's silent and (laughs) (laughs) Which definitely adds to that intensity and yeah, you can literally just hear your hands like and you're like, oh wow. Um, yeah, it's definitely an intense piece and I think that's why a lot of people struggle on it. You know, for a, a lot, I'd probably say 70% of gymnasts, I'd say pommels is their worst piece. Uh, the piece that they probably hate the most, the piece they struggle on the most. But I'm quite lucky in terms of that, it's my favourite and it's my strongest piece. So, yeah, it's an intense one. And it's definitely, because it's about balance, you're working on a, you know, small margins. It's probably one of the hardest to compete for that reason. But yeah, it's, it's hard when, the, 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 when it's silent, definitely. But also, it's one of those events where if you put me on rings, I can physically hang off rings. I could swing my body about and have a bit of a laugh on rings. On the floor, I could do a forward roll. On the vault, I could do something on a vault. 
Whereas the horse, I can do precisely nothing. It's, it is meant, do you, is your core just immeasurably strong? It, it's tough. It's definitely a tough thing. And I think the most annoying and frustrating thing about pommel horse is that it's probably one of the, like you say, it's probably one of the hardest skills to even learn the basics on, uh, pieces to learn the basics on, sorry. But it's one of the pieces that, to people that don't know gymnastics, they think every skill is the same. You're just spinning around and it looks the most basic, um, which is so tough as a pommel specialist because it's really hard to get across how tough it is. One thing um, we kind of touched on, Lewis, is I remember at the Olympic test event in at the O2 Arena I'm gonna say it was February 2012 I'm not sure exactly when it was um I spoke to him afterwards and he said I am so overweight for this and he didn't look he didn't look overweight but he said I am I think he said something like I'm six kilos heavier than I should be for this and I said can you feel that and he said mate you feel every kilo isn't does that does that apply to yourself because you seem to just come in almost the same condition year in year out i'm one of the the lucky ones in that um there's a lot of gymnasts <laughs> that you know there's a lot of people that put weight on easier than others my metabolism must be crazy fast because um my weight stays consistent um quite often which a lot of people hate me for saying that um <laughs> but it it does. So I think with that, I'm always around kind of 62, 63 kilos. Um, so I kind of don't have that proper experience in terms of um, feeling the extra weight. But even at my weight and even just, I don't know if it's fluctuating slightly, but even some days, I mean, you can feel heavy. Even if you're not heavier, you can feel heavier, um, which as a gymnast, you're, it's all about body weight. So lifting, your, lifting yourself, body weight exercises, body control and everything. So if you just feel heavier and you're not actually heavier, that makes a huge, huge effect. So if you feel heavier and actually are heavier, especially six kilos, you're going to struggle big time. Um, so that's going to have a huge impact on, on, on balance, on strength, on everything in gymnastics. Yeah. Lewis, I suppose, was a guy known for he definitely enjoyed both sides of life. I'd say on the on the pommel horse and off the pommel horse. And some could argue that's a distraction. But in the same way, someone like Usain Bolt, that actually helps him perform and be relaxed. You've got a very different form of distraction as of February last year, which brings me on to your third moment that made you. And I, and I, I, I would imagine it's the best of all the moments. A hundred percent. Yeah. Having Willow, having my little girl is... Yeah, it tops everything. Um, absolutely puts put lots of things in perspective. It really does do that. Um, and I think inside of sport, outside of sport, Willow has taught me so much. It's helped me be actually more calm as a person in a in a weird way as well. Um, it's yeah, it's the best thing in the world. And don't get me wrong, like when Leah was going through labour and pregnancy, for me it was the scariest thing in the world. Uh, it really was. But holding your baby for the first time is just you you can't explain that feeling and it's it's crazy um and when you talk about kind of having a baby whilst being an, an athlete you know people did talk to me about how am I going to cope how am I going to manage how am I going to stay at this level and compete like I am um a lot of people spoke about the kind of negatives that's what I found and for me, I knew it was going to be a challenge, there was no doubt about it, but I wasn't willing to put having Willow off for anything, really. Um, me and Leah were so ready to have a baby, and um, we really, really wanted our baby, and, and I wanted to have a baby while I start, whilst I was competing, and competing at this level. So I want Willow to come around, travel the world with me, see what I do for real life, not just watch it on YouTube videos or anything like that. So that, that was hugely important to us and you know I kind of just blocked the negativity out I saw I knew it was going to be a challenge like I said but I thrive for challenges massively and this was kind of a new one that's going to be a little bit different I'm going to have to learn how to adapt and 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 change like for example change my training routine structure sleep pattern there was no doubt that that was going to change I was used to 10 11 hours sleep before Willow come along 
Um, and that's definitely not happening now and definitely not not at the moment, <laughs> my God. <laughs> um, yeah, it goes through phases. So and I think I've had to be more adaptable as an athlete. And I think actually, if you, if you look at that, exactly in this time where we're like in, in lockdown, we're going through a global pandemic, we've had to be adaptable, we've had to be flexible. So in terms of actual life skills, you know, Willow's helped me massively with that. But in terms of my sport, it's been hugely, hugely positive. And one of my proudest achievements is, you know, Willow was born on the 23rd of February, 2019. And one week exactly later, I had the English Championships coming up, which was a trial for the Europeans coming up that year. So competitions are coming around fast. And I had that in my mind. And if I wanted to go to Europeans, I had to go to English. So I remember, um, you know, going there, I trained a couple of times that week, not a lot because it wasn't a priority. It was Lear and Willow. And I went there and I literally turned up for the last bit of warm up and warmed up my pummel horse routine, competed on pummel and then went um, so I could get home. And I I think I was there for about 40 minutes in total. Um, And um, I won pummel. Um, (laughs) so that that actually gave me so much confidence because then you know when I was young I I always thought I have to have a perfect build up to go into competitions I have to um, to help me compete the best I can but actually I've realised as I'm getting older it helps massively but if you've got your mind setting right and if you know you've done all you can in that build up and you're confident and your confidence is there you can do it um, and I've done it in that scenario and it, it helped me massively and it helped me going into the Europeans which I then qualified for um, six weeks later so yeah when I was seven weeks old and the toughest thing was going away you know I was away for three weeks I think it was just over um, it was in Poland and um, bearing in mind I was coming off a I was a scene I failed in 2018 because I didn't get the gold I got the silver um, and that was seen as a big failure for the whole year um, so I was saying in interviews everywhere that, you know, it is part of the plan, you know, not to not win the gold, but it's part of the plan that I'm putting in the risk of those years. So it was yeah. inevitable that mistakes were going to happen. But doing so, I piled the pressure on in 2019, 100%. So I not only had the pressure of proving myself that I was right and proving to everyone that what I was saying was true, um, but also the pressure of a new challenge of having a seven week old baby. And I went to Europeans and I managed to come out with a golden pommel again and it was just like I think I think I will be honest and one of the biggest emotions was relief um because it was tough like there's like there's no doubt about that that build up was was really tough um sleep wasn't great preparation wasn't great um I just had literally a newborn um but I managed to do it and I managed to pull off my result on what I wanted to do and that moving forward has taught me a lot um, going into the competitions that I had after it um, and taught me a lot actually in this situation now that everyone's in the same boat. No one's built up to 2012, tw- Tokyo 2020, 2021 Olympics <laughs> now is, um, is, is going to be perfect. Everyone's going to, you know, their build up's going to be shaken and mucked around a lot. Um, but I want to be one of those athletes that can actually come out hopefully in top condition um, and utilise this time and know that, you know, these experiences that I've had, you know, going to comps without the best build up, I can still perform to my best. So I know I can do it. And it's, that's helps me so much in my sport as well. A lot of this uh, kind of does speak to your relationship with your coach, because he's seen you go from a teenager who's ultimately a child to an adult to a European champion, a world champion, an Olympic champion, now a dad. You're managing an awful lot there, but he's having to manage you that's managing that as well and still have that, I suppose, symbiotic relationship where you respect one another, but he understands that it's not going to be the same. It, it, it says a lot about him. Oh, massively, massively. And I, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for what Scott has done for me, 100%. He's done... Yeah, crazy amounts and, and, you know, brought so much to me, taught me so much um, and been a huge support the whole way through um, and a huge guidance. And one thing that actually I think has helped our relationship is actually we, we're family. We're actually family. You know, he's, he's my brother-in-law, 
I think that's it. I think that's right. Um, so he's family. So Willow is family to Scott. You know, we, so he fully understands it and actually, you know, not just understands it, but encourages it. You know, he is he's, he's massively part of it. So we work together and I think that's what it's become. It's been a huge partnership that we work together to find out how I can work best. So it might be that we have to, we have to both be adaptable. Maybe, you know, today I can't go into training, um, but let's see how we can make it up um, throughout the week. And, you know, because my life has got a lot busier now and he's realised that he's, he's got a lot busier. You know, you, you get older, you, like you said, I'm, I'm, I'm a dad now, which for me seems surreal and still feels weird saying it, but, you know, we have to learn, we have to adapt and he's been hugely supportive the whole way through and, yeah, he's been, you know, calm the whole way through because he's had to cope with different situations where he's had to just change his mindset and how maybe how he does things and how he works normally because I'm the only dad on the team. So you have to individualise plans on well, how's Max training plan looking like compared to my training partners because everyone's different and everyone's an individual. Re- now Tokyo 2021, a lot has changed, a lot hasn't changed. You're still at the top of your game. You're three times world champion, but like we said, you're a dad. Does that change how you approach Tokyo in terms of when you actually get on that plane and you head out there? Will your head be in the same place? It's all about winning. Will it be about putting on a show for your daughter? What will be going through your head then, do you think? I want to try and do that as well, definitely. But I want to try and... Because I want to try and... I think it gains, gives me more motivation. I want to try and make Willow proud as well. I've got that another form of motivation who I want to make really proud as well. Um, but 100%, I have the same mindset. And I think what the mindset is exactly is actually going into Tokyo Olympics like I haven't competed in Rio or London. Um, it's going into Tokyo like it's my first Olympics. And that's something that I... I don't even think about doing, I just naturally do, um, which I think helps me so much. When I talk about how hard it is producing results after results, that's something that is absolutely key for what I do. I actually tend to forget about what I've done um, in terms of my titles that I've gained um, and, and go in there like I am as hungry I was in my first Worlds, in my first Europeans, first Olympics, um, and if I can keep that mindset, I can hopefully carry on going and carry on producing results because I've still got the same hunger. I've still got the same drive. I've still got the same motivation in training that, you know, I've still got big targets I want to achieve. And Tokyo isn't my end goal. Like I, I want to see my career through to definitely Paris 2024. And if I can carry on after wow. that. If I can carry on and go to LA after that, then I will definitely be there. Um, the longer I can go on for, the better. I love what I'm doing. I love training. I love competing. Um, there's no reason for me to stop unless my, my body gives up on me. But other than that, I'll, I'll keep going and hopefully keep producing results for the country. Uh, and we'll love to see it. Do you think Uchimura will be there in Tokyo? It's a tricky one. Um, he didn't get picked for last year's Worlds. Um he is getting quite a bit older now um, and he's trying to do all around. It was tough because he said, you know, after Rio, I remember sitting in a press conference with him and he said that this is the moment where he specialises. Um, I'm not sure what changed his mind, but a little bit of time after that, he then come back and done all six apparatus, so he didn't specialise. And, you know, injuries started coming Um yeah, and people started to kind of come up through, you know, ranks. You, when, you, when you talk about Japan gymnastics, the amount of depth that they have on their team and their squad is unreal. So staying on top is unbelievably hard, even just getting selected for competitions. And um, he didn't get selected last world. The main reason for him continuing um, after Rio was because a home games for him was coming up. So I'm praying, I'm praying that he's going to be there. Um, you kind of, you never want to see kind of your idol, and obviously for me, the best gymnast has ever lived. You never want to see them drop. So I'm hoping that he comes back with a vengeance and just really kind of proves everyone wrong and and comes back and makes that team and does what he want to do. Um, and then maybe he'll retire after that. Who knows? But it'd be great to see him there. And what would it mean if I were to have a photo 
taken of you, taken of my TV screen, or maybe I'll be at the actual venue. Max Whitlock, all around gold medalist, Willow in one arm, Uchimura silver medalist in the other arm. <laughs> <laughs> it would be incredible, but um, I I made a decision to specialise. So I I. I'm more of a specialist gymnast now, so I can't, you know, see myself going and doing all round because I made a decision that, you know, if I want to prolong my career, I need to reduce what I'm doing. Um, and I, there was a lot of targets that I still wanted to hit, uh, especially on pommel horse. Um, there was a lot of targets I wanted to do, not lose skills that I wanted to do. And if I wanted to stay on top, um, I need to keep improving and keep increasing my start value. Um, so I, I made sure that after Rio, I, do you know, I actually made that decision before Rio. Um, and I remember going wow. and sitting, I went to, I went around Scott's house and I said that, you know, after Rio, I want to become a specialist. And it was hard. It was a really hard decision um, because I've been an all-rounder my whole time up until that point. And for me, it was kind of irrelevant how Rio goes that's my decision and that's my plan because I had big reasons behind it and it was just trying to continue in the sport for as long as I can. I have to protect my body now to make it still stand, you know, and, and still be at that level in in six, eight years' time. You, you never know how long I can go on for. So, um, yeah, that scenario would be be amazing, but, um, you know, for, for me, it's, it's I, I want to go there if I can be in peak condition by Tokyo put myself in exactly the same as what I've done in Rio, um, try and put myself with the potential of gaining titles. Um, you know, I've got a lot of motivation to do so. I have, I feel very proud of gaining world titles, Europeans and Commonwealth titles, but I haven't done it with Olympics yet. So that's kind of, you know, one thing that I'd love to tick off um, and I'm going to work as hard as I can to hopefully get there. And yeah, it'd be great to obviously do it well and try and make Willow proud as well. Mate, absolutely. Well, we're all proud of you, mate. We can't wait to see you compete next year. Fingers crossed. Your, your body stays injury free. Please stay healthy and safe uh, during lockdown. And mate, roll on 2021. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That was Max Whitlock. Along with A. Clancy, I think they are possibly two of the most successful Olympic athletes that you never hear from. Max is quiet. He's humble, but just below the surface, there is an immeasurable determination. Actually, and much like Denise we had on last week in the heptathlon, the progression that GB Gymnastics have made in the last 20 years is incredible. But the other great thing about Max is that he's of an age in gymnastics where he might be considering retirement, but from what he was saying there, he's not going anywhere soon. So next year in Tokyo could be yet another special Olympics for him. Now, as ever, if you enjoyed that podcast, please rate, review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. And make sure you watch next week's episode on the moments that made me in association with the University of Hull for our final episode of the series. And we're going out with a bang with none other than England and GB's women's footballer, Ellen White.